The second one of the two sites in Athens, uh, the Acropolis Museum and the Museum of Antiquities. Um, today we're going to take a look at uh, Delos, uh, Santorini, and uh, Delphi. Now, uh, what I've done on both presentations is started at the beginning and gone to the end, so to speak, which means we'll go prehistoric all the way through to uh, what the Greeks did in the Roman period. Uh, the reason I've done it this way is because it, it just seems to make sense to take it chronologically because you can begin to see how things change. Now, with these three museums, Santorini, Delphi, and Delos, the one thing you should know is that they don't all have all periods. And so I've kind of interspersed them in order to present some sort of a rational understanding as we go through. When you get done today, hopefully, you'll be able to spot what uh, types of particularly sculptures uh, belong to which period. And that's nice because what it does is it lets you look at something and have a little bit of understanding as to when it occurred and why. And that's what I'm going to try to provide for you. All right, let's go. There we go. All right, the first thing I think it helps to understand is how centuries and years are documented. Uh, obviously, you, zero year is, in our calendar, is the year that Christ was born. So, AD centuries, that's after he was born, generally run, you know, right from one through to today. Uh, we name centuries for the last year in the century. So, 1901 to 2000 is the 20th century. Okay, if you do BC, it's precisely the opposite. 1700 to 1601 BC is the 17th century. Why? Because we start at zero and you don't get a century till you go 100 years one way or the other, up or down. It makes sense? Has anybody got a problem with that? I need to, I want, I want you to understand that from the beginning. All right, so in AD, we number forward. The year 10 is earlier than the year 90 AD. BC is the opposite. 90 BC is earlier than 10 BC. It's basically stating the same thing I stated up top, but just with an example to show you a particular year. Okay. How do we estimate how old something is? Well, you know, it's 2020. Add 2000 years if you want to know how old something BC is, and you're going to be within 20 years of being correct. So 705 BC plus 2000 is 2,700 years old. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Oh, incidentally, that's the uh, picture back in the 1890s of them finding a statue in one piece at uh, Delphi. All right, we're gonna start with prehistoric antiquities. Now, these things are, date between 7,000 to 10, 1050 BC, that means about 9,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, hmm? if we add the 2,000 to each or so about, I'm sorry, no, that's not centuries, take it back, seven, I mean, seven, I'm talking, yeah, I am talking correctly, yeah. Prehistoric antiquities include things that are Neolithic, which is Stone Age. Remember that, Neolithic means essentially Stone Age. Bronze Age, is the thing that follows the Stone Age. And so 7,000 to 3,000 BC, 5,000 years ago, is your Neolithic. Your Bronze Age brings us right up to uh, three, three, three and two, 5,000 years ago. And 5,000 to 3,000 years ago is the Bronze Age. Uh, what we're looking at here is a clay ball. You can see that there was some decoration on it. The problem with a lot of this old pottery is that uh, the stuff has been in the ground and we don't always know how much decoration. A lot of it gets obscured by the fact that the clay is essentially very similar to whatever the ground was that was around it. And so it tends to begin to decompose. All right, the history of Greece. The Bronze Age is what we're gonna really look at here in the beginning and that 
is where essentially they were able to, for the first time to take a metal, forge it or cast it so that it could be used as a tool, whether it's a sword, a dagger, a saw, all of those types of things. Once you had saws that were made of bronze, woodworking became far finer than it had been before. You can do a lot more with a piece of bronze into something than you can do with a piece of uh, stone, right? Three civilizations in this period that we care about. The Mycenaeans are the mainland Greeks. They're what we would consider, you know, the Athenians and your uh, Corinth and, and the major cities. Then you had Crete on the island, uh, the Minoans. Now they had a major civilization that really was far in advance of the Mycenaeans. toward the beginning and middle of the Bronze Age. However, by the end, they were eclipsed. And they were eclipsed because of an island called Santorini. Uh, it's one of the Cyclades. And what you essentially have is a circular group of islands, uh, volcanic in nature, as is most of this area. And uh, what occurred was a major eruption uh, on Santorini that we'll talk about in just a moment. But these are the three civilizations that are basically fighting each other, so to speak. Uh, what you'll find is when the volcano went off on Santorini, uh, it decimated uh, Thera, which is what Santorini was called at that time, and also decimated the north coast of Crete. How do we know that? Because they found in amongst dry type rocks, mountain type rocks, volcanic type rocks, a layer of seabed that would have been there for a certain period, uh, caught, trapped in, in some of the valleys in the northern part of the country to the point where, you know, until the stuff died off and then it was covered again with more, more rocks. So we know that occurred. Um, but let, let's go on. And I'm gonna play a video for you now. Uh, I need to know that you can hear this as it starts, okay? So let me know if there's a problem. More than 3,000 years ago, a giant volcanic eruption buried the city of Akrotiri on the ancient island of Thera, now known as Santorini, turning it into a time capsule. Could this be the inspiration behind the myth of Atlantis? And if so, where is the volcano that buried the ancient city? Most volcanoes form a conical mountain with an opening at the summit. This opening is called a crater or caldera. At first glance, there's no volcano like this to be seen. Today, Santorini is actually made up of five islands. Three outer islands encircle two smaller ones. The larger inner island is called Nea Kameni, meaning New Burnt Island. Volcanologist Floyd McCoy is traveling there to reveal the island's hidden secret. It emerged from the sea literally overnight, as recently as 1707. This little island in the middle is a volcano. It's the center of an active volcano. And if you're not sure about that, just look behind me. These fumaroles are telling us that there's plenty of magma beneath our feet. That says this volcano is plenty active. This tiny volcanic island seems too small to be the source of the giant eruption that buried Akrotiri. But seen from above, a new picture emerges. This is one of the most spectacular sceneries, I think, in the world. As a consequence of volcanism, and not only that, it's a consequence of a disastrous eruption. The entire bay, seven miles across, 
is in fact an enormous volcanic crater. There is the lip, the edge of the caldera, and a cliff line that outlines the ancient crater, or caldera, of that massive volcano. 1,000 foot high cliffs mark the rim of this monstrous crater. Experts don't believe the volcano is likely to erupt anytime soon. But 3,500 years ago, there is clear evidence it erupted on a terrifying scale. And the dig at Akrotiri has revealed clues that its inhabitants had warning of what was to come. Here we can see the sequence of events that led to the final uh, destruction of uh, the settlement. In about 1600 BC, Akrotiri was rocked by a violent earthquake. Then perhaps several months later, the volcano issued a warning shot, covering the city in a layer of ash an inch deep. Okay, so again, this is what the island looks like now. What, what's interesting here to me is uh, 1613, I've heard it bandied as much as 1645 BC. I don't know that it matters particularly. What's interesting is Neocomini has popped up in the last couple hundred years from nothing to an island this big, which is suggestive that it's going to continue to grow. Uh, not unlike uh, a lot of other places where islands do pop up, the Hawaii chain, the Iceland chain, the difference is these are volcanic, this is a violent type of eruption, whereas those are relatively benign. Uh, at any rate, Krakatoa in 1883 generated a 100 foot high tsunami. That's in Indonesia. Now, this one is believed to have been as much as 10 times as large. Now, I'm not saying that there was a thousand foot wave that went out, because it's a series of waves, obviously. But uh, as far down as Crete, which you'll see on the map in a second, was quite a bit below it, it wiped their north shore out. And uh, as I say, left deposits of uh, sea in places where they were slightly inland where they shouldn't be there. And so obviously it went over the top of the hill through the valleys or whatever and did quite a job. The downturn in the Crete civilization was about 200 years long and it began at this point. Uh, 200 years, 250 years after this, uh, the mainland Greeks would conquer Crete and that would be the end of the Minoan civilization. This is what it looks like today. You saw it in the video. Now, this is the Museum of Prehistoric Thera, and it gives you this is the first one we're going to look at a little bit. Santorini is one of the oldest continually inhabited islands on the whole Mediterranean Sea, with the history going back before 3000 BC. You can view some of the amazing ancient artifacts at the Thera Prehistoric Museum. This museum is often confused with the Akrotiri Archaeological Museum, which also contains finds from prehistoric times. The prehistoric museum of Thera is conveniently located in Fira, the main town of Santorini. So if you're staying in the town, no special trip is needed. The museum contains relics going back to 3300 BC and the Neolithic age, when the cycladic phase of early European civilization was just getting started. There are plenty of exhibits from the Apogee of Thera, which was what Santorini was called in ancient times, in the 17th century BC. The best finds include amazingly lively and colorful wall frescoes and a solid gold ibex that was unearthed just a few years ago. And it's exciting to think that the volcano beneath your feet blew it all away. Okay. So if we take a look at the island structure here, you'll see that they somewhat circle around fear. And so that's what we're, we're looking at. Uh, if you go down another several inches below the bottom of the screen, you'd see that Crete is there. Uh, 
this stuff is interesting, but I'm not going to dwell on it. It's just how the folks lived in, in different places. In the beginning, they lived uh, with no protection at all. In the second phase, uh, they went to the hills because they were being attacked, perhaps by Crete, which eventually dominated them. And uh, finally, uh, things were pretty much coastal because they were doing trade with Crete and the rest of Greece. Um, they were generally influenced by the Minoan uh, Sea uh, domination. And uh, again, as I told you before, everything kind of took a turn for the south once the volcano went off. What we have here on the right is a fragment of a wall painting. And I think the thing that's interesting about it is how intense the colors are. Uh, they're very fortunate to have uh, unearthed this. As you can see, it's been pieced together like most antiquities you, you run into. Uh, uh, if you have a piece of modern sculpture, the worst thing can happen is it breaks, it becomes somewhat worthless in a lot of people's eyes. All ancient sculpture has been broken somewhat. That's just the nature of it. Uh, we go a little further, you'll see even later statues are often missing the tips of noses, arms, legs, you name it. So um, this has been pieced together. It's quite a nice piece. And uh, as I said, the thing I don't quite understand is, see the little legs underneath it? I don't know what exactly the point of that was. And, and it was never explained. On the bottom of the picture, there, there's two humans, I believe, uh, behind the wall, whatever that means. Uh, now, we. We'll take a look first at the earliest kinds of figurines. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things with these because it's easy to identify them. And these are the, the island ones, the cyclotic ones, the ones from Santorini. And that is the fact that you will generally get the crossed arms and the shape generally is, uh, has been described as a violin shape where it comes, bows out, bows out, and then goes down. The figure's extremely stiff. And uh, as I said, that's what they did. Now, no one actually says this, but it occurs to me in looking at these, they're probably funerary objects, type of things that would be placed in a casket uh, or by a body when it was buried, because just the nature of them, they're in repose. Is that the case? I, I'm not certain. Again, we run into the same shape if one goes to the female figure. It's not a whole lot different. Uh, I think when they were making them, they could probably decide rather quickly. Uh, they're hand formed. They're not done on a wheel or anything, so they can just play with the clay. A little later on, the shapes seem to have just a slightly different feel to them. The arms are still crossed, the legs are still stiff, and yet the feel of the figure is just a tad more uh, natural, or maybe unnatural, I'm not certain, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, legs are elongated, uh, the head is now changed to, to that crowning piece, which obviously is some sort of a, a hair, I mean, you know, hat for want of a better word. Uh, chances are uh, things such as the breasts, lightly modeled but enhanced with brightly colored pigments. Uh, it just is a little bit more uh, stylized. And then we go into some of the things that were made. Now, it is really difficult, as I told you, to determine just how ornate or not a particular piece might be because of the fact that it's been fished out. Uh, it's been pulled out from either lava or ground. And so we really don't know how nicely figured these were. But uh, as we go through, you'll see more evidence of the fact that uh, they were probably turned a lot of them on a wheel. Uh, this is a bronze dagger, uh, not an unusual thing to find in a Bronze Age civilization, of course, everybody had them, Chinese had them. Uh, you find them in India, you find them anywhere that they went through the Bronze Age, Europe, uh, Northern Europe, that is, which was much later, of course. Uh, now, these are interesting. The one probably, the amphora, looks like it was probably turned on a wheel. 
because the getting something to be that precisely cylindrical is tough just by hand. And then, of course, they attach the uh, handles. Anybody can, knows more about this, Mark, particularly. If you want to butt in, feel free. But uh, they'd attach the handles after the thing had been turned and then fired. The one down below the plate, on the other hand, does not look like one that was particularly turned on a wheel because it is not uh, symmetrical. Uh, there's places that are higher, places that are lower. So it doesn't look like it was made in the same type of way as the Amphora was. And again, we're looking here 4,400 years ago to 4,200 years ago, quite a while. Then we come up and all of a sudden it looks like they're doing much nicer things at about 2,200 to 2,000 BC. Uh, it's, it's a very, very nice uh design something obviously that was you know by hand put in or either that or stamped i don't know which considering that the surface is not flat probably by hand i would think uh but they began to do nicer things and uh unfortunately the clock's ticking <laughs> because we had 2000 we're only about 400 years away from the eruption but things continue to get nicer look at the nice glaze on the piece on the right, uh, the jug. It's really a lovely, lovely piece. Uh, obviously there are different types of uh, glazing over it. Whether that's a result of being in the ground a long time or whether that is, uh, hold on, I gotta let somebody in. Whoop, I think. No, oh, let me see something here, just a moment. All right, you can hand form perfect spheres and in, 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 uh, cylinders. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, I, I, you can. Uh, whether they did it, I don't know. Uh, if it's an honest answer, it's it's hard to tell. It's a little late. Yeah. What else? Christiane is probably not a, bur a burnished, not glazed. All right. I'm not a pot pottery guy, so you have to forgive me. Uh, my art tends to be two dimensional. Uh, so at any rate, moving along here, and thank you. We finally get to the point down here where, although it's been pieced together, you can see there was a lot of interesting drawing on the on the uh, the, the bowl. Uh, here it's hard to tell, and again, I, I think that's somewhat typical of you know is was it originally a fine piece or a household piece? I don't know, but it's, at this point it's really hard to tell. Uh, one thing I would say is that. This looks a little bit more heavy handed in how it's formed than this handle here, which is the best I can use to try to determine that the one was a fine piece, the other probably was a not so fine piece. But I mean, everybody had to have them, so. And then we come up with things like this. Now, it's always, I'm always interested when I see bulls and cows because I've got a, uh, um, a, uh, piece uh, from China that is somewhere between 200 BC and 200 AD that's very similar to this. Uh, everybody had cows and bulls and so they portrayed them. Uh, what it would be used for, who knows? It could be a funeral object. It could be something kids played with. It's hard to tell. Uh, no one's around to tell us. And remember this is prehistoric so we don't have any writings to indicate particularly uh, what they did with them. Uh, and we'll get to the writing in a bit. Now, as we get closer to the eruption, now we're just maybe 200 years away, we begin to get pieces that are obviously decorative for the sake of being decorative. Pieces we've seen up to now mostly were things that you needed for the home. These are things that could be brought out and people would go, oh, isn't that nice? So, you know, that's the development of this prehistoric uh, art that uh, they really began to take an interest in portraying things. And I'll show you more in a bit. As a video on Acrotaria, this basic. This is a tourism. So, 
both cultural and geological, that spans thousands of years. The island is essentially the remains of an enormous volcanic explosion that took place at the height of the Minoan civilization. Amazingly, Akrotiti was partially preserved by volcanic ash. Right now we're in the ancient settlement of Akrotiti. This is considered to be the Pompeii of the Aegean because it's been preserved by volcanic ash. What you see behind me is a village that dates back to the 1650 BC, which is Middle Bronze Age period, but they found artifacts that date back to the 5th millennium BC, which is late Neolithic period. Santorini has great shopping, awesome wine tasting, but they also have incredible history, and you can't miss this site. All right, I'm going to move past that because then he did devolves into a bunch of things that we're not interested in. For what it's worth, when he did it, it cost five euros to get in. Okay, this is the house of Thranium. Now, why is that significant? I will show you. Right in here, I believe in there, they found the famous gold ibex. Uh, kind of like a deer type figure. And uh, here's what it looks like. Now that's gold. It's hollow gold, obviously. And you can see where they molded the legs and the head on. They did the body, it was, was cast. They used the lost wax method, which basically means you, you melt a bunch of wax into something, then you pour the hot molten metal in and it forms. Uh, and I would assume there's probably some piece in the middle that that doesn't isn't wax, probably at the tail or at the head, uh, where uh, it just forms a hollow rather than a uh, solid piece because it takes uh, quite a while as a practical matter for a solid piece to solidify. You wouldn't want to do it anyway. Gold's expensive, so at any rate. Uh, they hammered the pieces together, probably heated them and hammered them. And uh, it, it's a heck of a piece. And it's just, it's just kind of incredible to look at something that's that old. And here we're looking 17th century. So we're looking, you know, over 3,000 years old. Now, they also found things such as this. It's a pair of fire dogs. A fire dog is basically a thing that holds wood in a fireplace. Okay, simply put, they've got little pieces of wood on it. Uh, what I think is interesting is, obviously they've got handles so you can move it, but they've also placed heads at the front of it. So instead of just being a utilitarian item, again, it's an item probably at the time, it was kind of nice looking. Uh, why just have a thing? I mean, you could make something out of a piece of clay that would hold the wood, but by putting heads on it, it makes it, I think, just a more interesting piece. So obviously someone cared enough to do, you know, to do that, didn't have to. Now, these are really interesting. These are plaster castings of a table and a chair. Now, what happened was, <laughs> apparently, the lava flow or the ash flowed around these pieces and solidified, leaving nothing where the wood had been. And so when they pour into something like that, they're able to pull what the table actually looked like. Now, I think the kind of the interesting thing about this table is it almost looks like it's empire, <laughs> which of course it isn't. Uh, it's French, what, 18th century at, at any rate. Um, so we have a chair. You can see the chair coming up. We only have one leg. They lost the other one, but the, the table basically you could you when they you could use the cast as a table, kind of interesting stuff. And this is 17th century BC. It's right before the volcano. And then just some some interesting little pieces that I think that, uh, are, are fun to look at: incense burners and little ovens. We have clay ovens still people use in lots of parts of the world. Uh, you put uh, coal or wood in them and uh, you can, you, can, you can cook it. 
bronze. And again, you know, we're, we're talking uh, the Bronze Age. They, they, they were able to cast the stuff. And it's a cast piece, it looks like uh, to me. Probably the handle's attached. And then, of course, the dagger. Now, the da bronze dagger is interesting because it looks like it's got some gold on it. Uh, it'll be my guess. And, and you'll see that there's a lot of other pieces out of the museums in Athens that actually have you know, figures in gold on bronze. So, but an interesting piece up here is where they'd attach a wooden handle. And you could use this uh, dagger to do all sorts of interesting things. Saws. I talked about woodworking becoming much more possible when we went from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. And here's a perfect example. This is a saw that probably if you sharpened it a little bit, you could use today. The problem with a bronze saw is, is, is the problem that bronze has versus uh, steel. Uh, it dulls very quickly and can't go through anything It's too hard. Uh, so you'd be sawing mostly softwood firs, I, wish, I should imagine. Some other pieces, uh, just I thought they were kind of interesting because they're just a little bit different. Hard to tell what, but if you take a look at this pan, the baking pan, it is not constructed really any differently than any pan you'd buy today in the store. It's riveted in just like you do today. Difference is the material. But it is quite amazing that we still use essentially the same pan that they used 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. And of course, you have these uh, clay seals. They would have been used to seal things or someone's personal seal. And I think what's interesting is, I think they did a heck of a lot better job on animals than they did on people, <laughs> frankly. Uh, a lot of these are very, very nice figures. A dog, a deer of some sort, and I'm not exactly certain what that is. But uh, there's a horse, uh, a, uh, a bull. So I say there are a lot of nice seals that they found. And again, these things uh, were preserved because the stuff fell around them and, and basically sealed them off from air so that they were able to be preserved all these years. Now we come to why this is prehistoric. Until 2000, the script that was used for commerce and in palaces was a script called Linear A. Uh, it's not Greek, it's Linear A, it's its, its own thing. Uh, what's interesting about it is until last year, it had not been deciphered. It existed on Crete. It probably spread to Thera, but may not have, uh, because it was replaced with Linear B. Linear B has been uh, translated for years. We know anything on a Linear B tower. And the sounds on the Linear A are probably similar, but until recently, they were not able. And they finally put a bunch of uh, mainframe computers together on it and were able to do a translation using the computers, which is real interesting. Uh, it's kind of how the intelligence community breaks code. At any rate, so A was replaced with B, which may or may not have actually been used on Thera, although some of it has been found there. It's probably, it probably originated on Crete. These were probably made in Crete. We don't know for certain. The reason that it didn't become the permanent Greek language was on the bottom here. And that is because generally beginning, the, the, all the words began without a consonant, which is not the way real words are. Most real words start with a consonant. And generally they could only use one consonant. So sperma or seed wound up being spelled pima. Now, if you read these things every day and you knew the type of words that were being used because it was commerce or whatever, you'd have no problem. You'd look at Pima and say, oh, that's sperma. You know, if they said, you know, 10,000 baskets of Pima, you knew it was 10,000 baskets of seeds or sperma. 
Same thing with strasmos, stable, ta, to, mo. Now, again, it's not the kind of thing that the average person is going to be able to do anything with. So about 750 BC, which is after what will be the Dark Ages, which follows these eruptions for the most part, a little later, you wind up with an adoption throughout Greece of the Phoenician alphabet, which allows you to do everything so that anyone can learn to read. Now that's not wholly dissimilar to what occurred in China when the communists took over and took the long form characters, which were works of art and turned them into short form characters, which could be learned about 1600 of them or so, and you could, you could read Chinese. Same difference here. Here, anyone could sound out what a word was. If you know how to sound out a word, you can learn to read. And that's what happened here. And you can see that uh, the starts off with the Phoenician, the Greeks modify it until we get to the modern, which is not a whole lot different than what we began with, frankly. Okay. And that's the basis, obviously, of, of what we use today in English, in fact, in every Western language. Okay, now we come to the, the, the ceramics of this end of this period, right before the eruption, and some of the things they did. And now we've gone from utilitarian to purely things created for beauty. Look at this one. First of all, is an anapomorphic eye and breasts, on the, on the piece in this lovely, beautiful form of a bird, okay? They did them for a number of different things. For instance, uh, they did it for agri agrarian things such as grapes and barley, seeds. They did them for wild plants, wild creatures, bulls, ebexes, goats, lions, dolphins, sea creatures, swallows, deer, you name it, and also demonic. And very rarely people, which is something that we've not seen on any of this stuff, with the exception of those kind of uh, crossed arm statues at the beginning, that had not been done for a while. So how do we compare what's on Fera Santorini to what is produced in Crete? Well, Take a look at the one on the left, and you will see that the design is far finer than the one that was produced on Thera in the beginning. Okay, now that difference is going to be less and less as time goes by. But once the Minoans dominated Thera, in the beginning, they kind of did knockoffs and they weren't as nicely done. Uh, and I mean, how can you tell? Well, first of all, the design is nicer. The handle is a little bit more petite. This is a little heavier handle. It's easier to do a heavier handle than a light handle and have it stay together. And just you know, basic things such as that. Uh, now, these are things produced on Akrotiri. And uh, the first one is uh, flower. The second one is one of with a beautiful swallow. And I, these are just, and you notice again, eye and the breasts on this one. They like to do those pouring things and, and, and uh, morph, uh, make them anamorphic, anamorphic, yeah. Nice designs. Uh, this is just a row of them where you can see kind of the stuff that was being done there right at the end. So, uh, and again, you know, is this a symbolic breast? I, my guess is it is, for what it's worth. Dolphin picture and some uh, lilies. Again, they didn't have to do this, but they did. The things would hold goods, whether or not they had beautiful pictures on them, 
but they had the pictures and they had the artists drawing them. Uh, the folks who made these are almost graduating from mere artisans to artists. Uh, I think that's most interesting that they, they cared about how the things looked. Look at this one. Uh, the, the ibixes running around. Another uh, of the bird of the swallow. They like swallows a lot. Dolphins too. Some grains. Again, uh, you want to know what's stored in the jar? Look. And it's showing you what they stored, I would assume. Nice way of doing it, particularly if everybody doesn't read. And uh, this is a uh, funnel. And again, I mean, it didn't need to have all this on there, but someone decided that they thought it would look nice to have it. And so they made it a beautiful piece. And some more of your anapomorphic stuff, the eye, I mean, the eye is really delineated on the one on the right. There's no question that that is an eye and that those are breasts. So. And they did some nice animal work. As I told you, I thought a lot of their animal work looked better than their human work. And uh, this stuff, I mean, this almost looks like a Toby mug on the right. Anybody familiar with those British Toby mugs? But I mean, that type of figure is very, very similar. I mean, you could basically take that, plop it into Britain in, in a used uh, uh, furniture store and someone would think it came off a Toby mug. So, I mean, everything is, I don't know, what's the original? I don't know. And I get some more, some nice bowls uh, um, on the bottom, some of the lovely birds. I mean, they churned them out. And now these are a couple, some pieces from Crete. Again, it shows you the Cretan stuff's a little bit finer. And these are also from Crete. Uh, Knossos was the capital of Crete. East Crete was obviously East Crete. And uh, these were brought in. And then finally, we have this one. Now, this was from the Greek mainly. Look at the difference in style. It's not at all like the Cyclotic or the Cretan, the Minoan stuff. It is uh, from the mainland. And it's a very, very different look to it than what the islands produced. And, uh, you know, Crete and Thera both were islands, different uh, type culture. Some stucco tables that somehow survived. And again, we've got the dolphins on them and the birds flying over. Uh, they were obviously, uh, it says they were, that was used for uh, offerings. I don't know. I mean, uh, always remember when anthropologists don't know exactly what something was used for, it's always the uh, way out to say it was a religious artifact. Uh, I remember we used to, I, I, I'm undergrad, I majored in anthropology and I'll tell you what we used to do we just just to chuckle the professor would chuckle and we'd chuckle if they didn't know what to call something they say it must have had religious significance mm, okay mainly because nobody knew what their religion was precisely so or you can't be wrong and finally uh some earthware uh just to show that they did stuff with different colorations and obviously alabaster was uh, available to them and it didn't exist on Crete so uh, or uh, on uh, uh, Thera, so they must have imported it and then carved. Wall paintings. Now you saw some of these in the overview for the museum. Uh, I have enhanced the pictures slightly so they show up better. They're not quite as vibrant as I have them, but I thought that it made sense to be able to actually see what they look like, being more important than to, to totally be accurate in representing them. Obviously, uh, these are really quite nice. Now, this one is somewhat typical of most ancient wall paintings and uh, a lot of things going up through the Renaissance, truly. And that is the fact that we tend to distort the important things in a picture. Take a look at the Renaissance picture here. It's out of a uh, Greek church uh, in the mountains in Turkey. And, uh, You'll notice the, the size of the of uh, Christ compared to the people is huge. 
Well, you wind up with the same thing here. You've got these people on the top where they would be way back. This probably the ruler, be my guess. And he's big. And then these folks are behind him, maybe his wife. And then, uh, you know, it's all out of proportion. What's important to them is big. What's not so important to them isn't. Then you have these. It gives you a feel for how women dressed, probably of the upper classes, I should imagine. But uh, it looks like they wore something that resembled a culotte, best I can tell, uh, but it can't be certain. See, looks almost like it's a culotte of some sort. It's two women. And that, that's that thing we saw before with the feet under it. Finally, a couple of kids boxing. Now, the darker skin color is what is real. The lighter skin color is what's been reconstructed. So you've got to take this one with a bit of, a, you know, the gold grain of salt here. But what they obviously are doing is boxing. Uh, the way the kids dressed, they wore two long tails in the back and two short ones in front. And all the kids running around would all have that hairdo for the most part. Uh, darker skin color generally indicates a male, lighter skin indicates a female. Uh, the boy on the left wears jewelry. It indicates a higher social status than uh, otherwise. This is an interesting wall. It's a monkey wall. Uh, now, you see the monkeys all over? Not unreasonable to assume that until the eruption, there were monkeys there. Uh, there are still monkeys at uh, the other end of the Mediterranean on uh, what's the big rock that the British still own that's in Spain? Uh, it escapes me at the moment. Um, the Gibraltar? Yeah, Gibraltar. And so it's not unreasonable to assume that somehow monkeys were there. Whether they were native or whether they were brought in, who knows? But we do know that these people traded all over the Mediterranean and into Africa. So it's not unreasonable to assume that they had monkeys there. Now, the Minoans from Crete down here were considered the first advanced civilization in Europe. The Mycenaeans, on the other hand, the, the mainland Greeks were considered the first Greeks. Uh, and as I told you, the volcano went off on Santorini over here, and the Minoan, uh, obviously Santorini was, their clock was clean, and the uh, Cretan uh, Minoan civilization began a 250-year downslide, which would result in the Mycenaeans eventually conquering them, okay? So now we're going to move on. And it's 221. I want to take a five minute break right now, and then we will do Delphi and we'll do Delos. And I think you'll find them, if anything, even more interesting than what we've done thus far. So it's 222 at uh, 227. Let's uh, come back together and we'll finish. Oh, Mark, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm good. I'm doing good. Thanks. How are you? How are you, good. Tom? It's good stuff, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy you included so much uh, of the ancient work, the clay work. That that stuff is fascinating to me. Well, it tends to get, because of the, the classical and the, uh, well, really the uh, archaic classical and uh, Hellenic, it tends to get ignored for the marble statues. And I think it's a mistake because the coloration follows into all of these statues, most of which were brightly painted. And we don't appreciate them that way. They look over the top to us, but to them, that was the way they were supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I thought of uh, when you showed the things yesterday, and then it just occurred to me last night, um, like that picture of Augustus, and I wondered about coins. Did they have portraits? Oh, yeah. Of people on coins back then, yeah. too? Is that a way uh, a to identify? Them, a lot of them are relatively crude. I mean, it's compared, compared to a statue like that that really is very, I mean, I mean, the guy could get up and walk into the room. He looks so good. I mean, I think that's the real difference. Uh, but yeah, sure, a lot of the coins showed what they looked like. 
what they want it to look like. Uh, I don't, you know, who knows exactly? Yeah. Uh, I mean, after all, I mean, portraits, however they're done, until very recently, were wholly at the uh, whim of the person being portrayed. If they didn't like it, they told them to do it over again. <laughs> Took them out and shot them. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess you have a lot less room to to elaborate or do details on a coin, but I just thought for like profiles or something. Yeah, they might well, that's what you get on the coins primarily is the profiles. In fact, I think I've got one or two at the end, but I think it's the next one, not this lecture, but uh, just okay. to show a little bit of what they look like. But frankly, uh, I, I think they're an item of, I mean, they're collectible because there were so many of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can buy Roman coins, but I'm not sure. Just a second. I have a barky dog here. I want to hear. shoo away. Rudy. It's okay. Now go, go see mommy. Come on, go find mommy. Sorry. <laughs> now that's okay. Do you need a break, Tom? Uh, no, I'm good. Uh, okay. Well, I tell you, last night was a joy. I got a, a nasal infection. I, oh, no. I finally fell asleep around 3.30, 4 a.m. Oh, shoot. It was nasty. I spent the morning at the doctor's. Oh. Getting, uh, the marsh is going to run out and pick up the prescriptions. But, I mean, it's been going on a month and a half or so. I finally oh. had it. Wow. You know, you, you, in the beginning, you figure it's a virus. And you just go, well, I have to wait till it's over. But after a month and a half, the... the, the Physician assistant I talked to and said, hey, I, I think it's time. So we'll see what, uh, if this helps. Well, I hope so. It's unfortunate yeah. that yeah. it flared up right before your talk. Uh, this is, fortunately, this is, you know, it's not a get up and do too much. So I can kind of take it easy. Yeah. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's on 225. We'll give another minute or two. But uh, yeah, it's nice to it's nice to do this. I enjoy the I mean, uh, teachings. Always, it's almost more fun to do the research and find this stuff than it is to to actually uh, be a pupil. I mean, uh, stuff goes by is too much to absorb. Uh, whereas when you're when you're learning this stuff to teach it, you really you know it imprints much better. It has mm -hmm. to. If you, anybody asks a question, you got to be able to answer it. Or you hope you can answer it. Yeah. Well, plus you got to go to to these places. That's yeah. that's really amazing. Well, I think it's more meaningful when you've actually been there. Uh, and this next place, Delphi, I mean, I think it, one of the great experiences getting a chance to actually see where the oracle was. I mean, it's just oh. kind of incredible. Wow. Well, I tell you what, let's let's go ahead. It's two twenty seven. Let us start again. Uh, anybody that's gone, come back. Okay. Uh, the first thing I do is play you a uh, nice video. A two-hour drive northwest of Athens takes us to Delphi, one of the most important sites in the ancient world. Wherever you travel, seeing the precious artifacts in the big city museums first helps you better appreciate the historic sites out in the countryside. Ancient Delphi, perched high in the slopes of Mount Parnassos, was not a city. It was the site of the Oracle of Apollo, god of the sun. People would journey here from all over the known world to seek wisdom from the gods on vital affairs of state. Today, tourists zigzag up the ancient sacred way to the Temple of Apollo. The path is flanked by the remains of Delphi's famous treasuries, monuments erected by city-states in gratitude for the Oracle's advice. Local guides like Penny Volum Kotsu bring these ancient and mythic events to life. So tell me why this place was chosen for the oracle. Zeus wanted to know where the center of the world was. He left two eagles fly from the two opposite ends of the universe, and this is where they met here in Delphi. So he called this basically the, the belly button of the world. Yeah, the Omphalos. Yeah, this wonderful place became the center of the world. The resulting sanctuary of Apollo reached the height of its power between the 6th and the 4th centuries BC. The oracle became so influential that no great leader would make a major decision without first sending emissaries to consult the oracle. 
There was a priestess inside the temple. Right underneath it, there was this room where she was inhaling vapors evaporating from the ground. So she was in trance. So she would babble and the priests would say, this is wisdom from the gods. Exactly. Because the priests debriefed those seeking advice on the state of their homelands, Delphi became the database of the ancient world. Because of that, the priests here were actually able to astound those who came with their wise, believably divine advice. And there was more to Delphi than just the oracle. So people from all over the Greek-speaking world came here. Correct. And apart from coming here to consult the oracle, the other reason was also because, like in Olympia, they had the Olympic Games. Here in Delphi, we had the Pythian Games. Okay. okay. Yeah, these were competitions concerning music, poetry, sport events as well. So, a, a balance of things, music and sports. Yeah, everything in moderation. Know thyself. The golden mean in everything. So we've got the theater, we've got the stadium. During those Pan-Hellenic, or all-Greek, festivals, Delphi filled its theater, which seated 5,000. And it packed as many as 7,000 sports fans into its stadium. I like being here at the end of the day, with the tourists gone, cheers of the long-gone crowd still ringing in the cool mountain air, and the starting block all mine. Now, I'm going to skip this one. It's an area of view of the area, but you've kind of seen it. So we'll move. This is what Delphi supposedly looked like back uh, when it flourished. Now, <laughs> it looks great. And uh, what I want to draw your attention to is this thing here, which we'll see again a little later and a couple other pieces like this one right here. Okay. And this is what, obviously what it looks like today. Now, we're back in the late Bronze Age. Now, I want you to notice that there's a difference with the figures. These are mainland figures. They are not the island figures with the crossed arms. They are mainland figures. Their arms are out. The top row is women. The bottom row, I believe, is men and some animals. After this period, in about 1100 on the mainland, the Dark Ages began, and they lasted about 300 years. We don't know why the Mycenaean culture, which was a highly stratified kingship down to slave, uh, type environment. Why that broke down? It could have been internal strife. The peasants could have raised up and gone after the uh, kings and such. Uh, it could have been some other invasion, Dorian invasion. I don't know. Uh, however, the damage done was profound. The whole thing broke down within 50 years about 1150 to 1100, it just totally, everything that was there before, everything you've seen up till now is all of a sudden gone. Now remember, these Mycenaeans had by this time also conquered Crete and Thera. So everything is gone. So what we've got is uh, obviously a time when if the palaces aren't there and the commerce is not there, there is no writing because they have not yet developed the Greek based on the Phoenician stuff that'll come around 750. But they did some quite remarkable artworks in this period anyway. Uh, two examples are these wine jugs. They went to a geometric type portrayal of things, uh, which was very, very interesting. Uh, and I'll show you a number of pieces, but we're gonna move quickly through them because we gotta keep going. Uh, but at this time, uh, we think they may have used the linear B, probably. But again, that wasn't something a common person would, would use. Uh, what happened in this period? Well, the most important thing that happened in the period was the first Olympics and Homer, who wrote his Iliad Odyssey. 
those things matter because they also showed some of what the history was from way back. This is the first records we have that are written of them. And they would be in Greek, what we know as Greek, not the linear A or B. Now, uh, real quickly, periods of instability have often seemed to me to be times that promote new philosophies, things that take societies to make uh, and cause them to make grand leaps. In China, the Warring States period gave us Confucius, Mao Tse, Lao Tse, Sun Tse, and Lord Shang, all of which today still fashion what Chinese uh, thought is. Whether it's the communist government, the nationalist government, doesn't matter. They've all, they all use these as justifications. Uh, the oppression by the church obviously resulted in travel, resulted in the Italian Renaissance, which is spread through Europe. Uh, absolute monarchies resulted in the Enlightenment, which resulted, which, which gave us Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams, Hamilton. So when things get really bad, that's when the thinkers come out. The old one, I'd rather live in interesting times. Bad thing, bad, bad situations create interesting times. All right, female figurines. You'll notice the hands are down the sides so or they're up. They're not crossed like out in the islands. We've made some progress on what the body looks like. These things actually begin to resemble what humans really look like, particularly the one here. Different types of things created out of bronze because we're still in a bronze age. And again, a shield, uh, what looks to have been a griffin. And then we, all of a sudden, and this is the thing that always amazes me, around 700, everything changes again. And now all of a sudden, they begin to settle into the city states, uh, where the only city state that had kind of existed throughout the Dark Ages was Athens. All the old cities were abandoned. Now we get the cities that we're familiar with, Corinth, and Sparta, and Athens. And all of a sudden, things begin to coalesce. Um, art changes. And we begin to get these archaic. Now you'll notice a couple things about her. First of all, she's kind of stiff, but the most important thing, the eyes and the mouth. The eyes have a kind of slant to them that you'll see a little more as we go through them, but the mouth, they got what I would call the silly smiles. And they all look like they're more related to each other than to real people, because people don't really look like that. So if we take a look at pottery, what do we have? These telling eyes and silly smile. And it's on all of that, plus that's the weapons that they're using at that point, okay? Terracotta, they, they're decorating the interiors of their buildings with these lovely terracotta borders. And, uh, they, and again, they're very colorful. Okay, and then we hit something like this. Now, all of a sudden, we've gone from little statues that are six inches high of people to monumental statues, which are over life size. These guys are over six feet tall, as you can see from the people behind them. These are the twins of Argos, and it was founded at Delphi. And uh, they're kind of interesting figures, wouldn't you say? So. Here's how they found them, 1893, 1894. These guys, they start digging and lo and behold, what did they find? A couple statues. And then we have the Sphinx. Remember I showed you that Sphinx on the top of that column when we showed what the place looked like? They were sent to Delos, I mean to Delphi by the people of Naxos, which was an island that was rich and uh, mounted on this columns. Here's what they look like today. And it's just incredible that these have been well-preserved. Now, again, I caution you, when you see the lighter stuff cast, that's not original. 
but being uh, they've got enough of it that they can pretty well tell what it looked like originally. And so there it is, complete with smile. Mom, Tom, what were those made out of? Uh, they would be made out of marble. Oh, they're marble. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of the marble is, it doesn't quite look like marble or some sort of stone, but it's, it's kind of dirty looking because it's been around a long time. You know, I mean, you really don't want to go clean them up too much, but then you lose the, the definition. It's the serpent column, I showed you that too. This was this commemorated a, uh, uh, a war that they beat the Persians in 479 BC. It was brought to Delphi. Now, see this part of the column? This is the bottom of the column. Constantine comes in and chops off the top of the column and takes it to Constantinople. And so you've got part of the column in Delphi. The rest of the, part, the rest of the column is now in uh, Constantinople. Here's what it looked like. Originally, it had three heads of snakes on top. Snakes were a good, considered a good thing. A lot of your people, a little later in time, classical, will be shown with snakes. It's a virility thing, I suppose. Here is one of the heads. The heads disappeared. <laughs> in the 18th century, but they found one. And so there it is. So this is what the column would have looked like. Obviously, whoever drew it didn't get the column's proportions real, real tight, but at any rate, that's what it looked like. So you've got this column at the bottom is in Delphi, the top is in Constantinople, and the pieces from the top are in a museum. Real quick, uh, Greek temples, pediments, metopes, friezes. Freezes generally toward the, in the interior and they go all around the whole building, generally forming some sort of a story around the whole building. Might start off with the gods, go to the warriors and then go to the slaves and people carrying the stuff for the society. And then as you come all the way around, you're back to the gods. The pediment is under the top of the roof. It's generally to the outside. And it's right under the top roof line, the, the one that comes down at an angle. A metope, on the other hand, is generally between architectural members below a pediment. Does that make sense? So these would each be its own separate little scene, whereas this would be one big scene over the whole top of the, of the thing. And, and you'll see in a second. This particular uh, illustration is, is from the Parthenon, because it's an easy one to find. This is what uh, the treasury uh, of Sifnos would have likely looked like. I say likely because no one knows for certain, but they've just kind of sketched in some scenes. Here you have a pediment and you have a freeze. There's no metope. And here's what it looks like because we do have these pieces and they're inside in the museum. And this is what the whole thing looked like. It is big. This is not something that's a little thing that fits in. This is the whole side of a room. These are big figures. But notice how much better detailed these figures are than what came before. Uh, there's really no comparison. And you can see where this is leading. These are, of course, are archaic. They're not classical, they're archaic, earlier. But uh, I mean, as I say, I, I, their humans have finally caught up with their animals. They're both really good. Just to give you a feel. I mean, there's this guy being about to bite the bullet. bullet. Let me see. But I think they, I think they're interesting figures, and I, I, I think that uh, this is what they would have looked like. Mark and I were talking about this at the break. It's hard for us to conceive that they would go ahead and paint <laughs> all of these things up. But as we go through, we're going to see, particularly when we get to museums in uh, two weeks, how an awful lot of the figures were painted up to the hilt. They thought that that was beautiful. This is a uh, silver sheet from a, a life-size bull. And it's mostly silver with some gold on it. Uh, just to show you that they 
these are certain things like this that they probably brought out some sort of a right having to do with fertility, I should imagine, bulls fertility. You know. Here's a bunch of gold they found. Now, what's amazing to me is all this gold was just left there and nobody found it. It must have been buried by somebody. But you can see the crown, different pieces that they had. This is what a figure would have looked like with that. And it is supposed to have been Apollo, they think. It would have been probably in the temple of Apollo, or the treasury of Apollo, the temple of it. Yeah. And then we get some other things. It just, just gives, again, but you note the smiles. It's, it's hilarious. Guy's in battle and he's got this goofy smile. Go figure. Again, some more. This is this Hercules and some of the things that you know, some of his tasks. And then the famous lions. Uh, we find lions a lot of places, and you know, we'll show you some more later. But uh, yeah, different ones, uh, different sculpture ability. I, I think the one on the uh, left is a little bit better than the one on the right. But then we get to the classical period. Now this is when. This is the apogee. Uh, this is the point that everybody looks at and says, wow. But you could see it was coming through the archaic period. Now we don't have the funny little smile on the face and we have a way that the body is standing that is far more natural. But it's natural without being over the top. When you get that Hellenic period, it goes over the top. But now it's just natural and they, they kind of revel in the uh, beauty of the human body for what it's worth. Obviously, they're not 71 like me. I don't think I could model for that one. Um, plus, he's naked. Uh, so at any rate, on we go. This is a uh, very, very interesting piece. She is <clears throat> holding up what would have been uh, something that a fire would have been on. So it would have been in a, in a room lighting it. But uh, again, they went to quite a bit of uh, work to do that. This is a family votive offering. It just goes to show you, if you had a lot of money, you had a bunch of statues prepared, one for everybody in the family, and you'd have your own place. Okay. And then uh, this is the type of thing that might be on the outside of someone's tomb, where you have uh, the uh, God who's big and the worshiper who's little. That would be probably who's buried there, the little one. And then you get some of these statues that look like they really were grand when they were done. Uh, you have uh, the king carrying away, abducting this princess of Athens. And it's just uh, it's really, really well done. Uh, it looks much better in person, but you can see the hole there where all the stuff is, it, it's kind of interesting. That's it from Delos. Uh, it's quite an interesting piece because uh, the torso is absolutely terrific. And then the animals, I always like the animals. Uh, from snakes to dogs. I mean, some of the, the dog is, is extremely sophisticated as is the other one. They're really, really well done. And they're cast in bronze. That's the incense burner. And this is the piece at Delphi, which is considered the piece. It's the charioteer from 470 BC. Uh, somehow this bronze got covered up due to an earthquake and was not dug up. It was left there and they were able to come in and obviously piece it together. And she is quite an interesting thing. Now, when you hear someone say that these folks in the classical period or Hellenic period did not, were, were, were kind of devoid of emotion, I, I don't see it. I mean, this woman is intense on what she's doing. And you'll see that a little later in some other ones that we do. And this is where, what it would have looked like in the center there. 
And then you get the, you know, some of the columns. Uh, all I can say is that it was very nicely done. And here's the belly button. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's thought that this may be a reproduction, a Hellenic or a Roman, a Roman copy of the original. It's hollow inside because this would have sat on top of the column over on the left. So you would have had this would have been on that, marking the center of the earth, the belly button of the earth. And then we get into some of the classic figures. And I mean, like I say, arms are missing, face is missing, but you really don't need it. Uh, it's quite an interesting, well done piece. This one's even in better shape. And I, I'm going to move obviously rapidly. Next, we get the Hellenic Greeks. Now, in 338, Philip and Alexander the Great, completed by Alexander the Great, basically took over all of mainland Greece. And they ushered in a period of city-states that were semi-independent because after Alexander died, everything broke up somewhat. But what they, what they wanted to portray changed a little bit. What they wanted to portray actually now was more the, the, the guts of the issue. They didn't care that the bodies had the tremendous rippling muscles that the classical stuff had. Here they wanted you to look at this figure and say, wow, what is he thinking? And I, and I think that in particular, something like this, I think they achieved. They portrayed certain different types of things. Here's a child. And uh, they're, they're showing, you know, a child with a bird. It's, a, it's really a beautiful thing. It's, it's the feeling that matters now rather than portraying this massive body, you know, with all the strength. And you'll see it as we get to some of the other ones. They're, they're thinner a little bit. Okay. Uh, don't ask me why they have this turned this way, but again, it's not something you'd see that was classical. This is definitely Hellenic. Uh, this, 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 this attempt at some sort of modesty, which is really not real. I mean, I don't know too many people hold something up in front of them, but let the back show the butt. Uh, it's, 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 it's a whole different way of thinking. And again, look at the figures. They're portraying people who are not these athletes who were just, you know, Mr. Muscle and, uh, and Don't I Look Pretty. These are people that could be you or I. It's a difference in thought. These are two theater figures. And uh, in a theater, uh, they're portraying different actors, are portraying different people in the plays, and that these would be those. Again, some of the other figures that you see from the period. Notice the bodies don't have that overdone musculature anymore. It's almost the difference between uh, Renaissance and late Renaissance mannerist stuff. Only this goes the opposite way, <laughs> right? The mannerist stuff is Michelangelo with all the muscles. The earlier stuff in the Renaissance didn't have that. They had these thin Christs on the cross and everything. It was just it's different, a different thought. They're trying to convey emotionally what happened as opposed to physically what's there. And then, of course, we go to the Romans. Uh, everything fell apart uh, into little city-states. By about 300 AD, the Romans had taken the whole thing. And so we wind up with something like this. Antunos, this guy was the, shall we say, co companion of uh, Hadrian. Hadrian's Wall in Britain, that Hadrian. And uh, he died in the Nile under mysterious circumstances. Well, you know, considering all the fevers and stuff that existed along the Nile, it, it might be legitimate. Then again, someone might have killed him. Who knows? So they, they dig this thing up. And uh, what does he actually look like? I mean, here you can see they're, they're digging up other things, too. Uh, there he is. Now, notice, I mean, he's got some reasonable musculature, but basically the face is the thing here now. Look at him. 
He is an intent, interesting person. He's looking at you. And what, what is your response supposed to be? I don't know. Depends who you are. Also, notice the hairstyles changed, and they do through the periods. All right, real quick. Delos. The island of Delos was one of the most important places in the ancient Greek world. With temples honoring the birthplace of the twin gods Apollo and Artemis. Centuries before Christ, Delos attracted pilgrims from across the Western world. Delos was important in three different ancient eras. First, as a religious site. Then, as the treasury of the Athenian League. That was sort of the Fort Knox of the ancient world. And later, during Roman times, this was one of the busiest commercial ports in the entire Mediterranean. Delos ranked right up there with Olympia, Athens, and Delphi. Survey the remains of the ancient harbor. Foundations of shops and homes and hillsides littered with temple remains. The iconic row of sphinx-like lions still heralds the importance of the place. This was one of the Aegean world's finest cities. Imagine Delos in its heyday, a booming center of trade. Streets lined with 3,000 shops where you could buy just about anything dazzling mansions of wealthy merchants with colonnaded inner courtyards. There were fine mosaics, like this one of the god Dionysus riding a panther. Culture thrived here, enough to keep this theater, which could seat 6,000, busy. Innovative cisterns collected rainwater. These round arches date from the third century BC. Plumbing ran under the streets and water was plentiful. Local guides demonstrate still working wells. One of the 200 wells and cisterns in the city. Fresh, drinkable water from the rich aquifer underneath us. And it was enough to supply the 30,000 people at the peak of the flourish of the city. 30,000. So for more than 2,000 years, water has come out of this well. You can still drink if you want. Very nice. About a century before Christ, Delos was devastated by a terrible war. It never recovered and was eventually abandoned. After 14 centuries of silence and darkness, it was finally excavated in the late 1800s. And today, the ruins of Delos are ours to explore. I capped my visit by... I'm going to have to move on because uh, we don't have a great deal of time. The lions of Delos are famous. And here they are inside. They've taken the ones that were outside. Uh, they've taken uh, a cast... They've cast from these to have those so that they would preserve these. They were out until the beginning of this century, last century, rather. Now, what has happened to the lions through the ages? This is an old picture of the lions down here. And this is what they did when the Venetians owned the place. They took a lion and look what they did, did to his head. Is that awful or what? Absolutely terrible. And it's still the arsenal in Venice if you go there. <laughs> uh, I agree. It's an atrocious modern head. Uh, and here are some of the statues from the period. Uh, Artemis and the muse. And again, you can see they're clothed. It's a wholly different. And then we come to the frescoes. And these are, I think, the real glory. The frescoes and the mosaics in Delos. Look at the... The, 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 the work that they did on these. I mean, these would have been in homes, they would have been in public buildings. And uh, a lot of them are not great art, but they're the art that they lived with, which I think is in a sense almost more interesting because you can almost imagine this in someone's home, the one on the right. Uh, again, we have the terracotta on the top where they uh, basically it would have been a, on the line right below where the ceiling meets the wall. And you have these, and it portrays all sorts of interesting things. I say just very, very interesting things. Here's someone sick with a, God knows what, a God coming to help them maybe. Here you have someone fighting, and uh, here's somebody with a dog and uh, some horses. Then you got these. Now, 
How many of these were professionally done, so to speak, and how many were done just by whoever lived there? I have no idea, but it, they really represent better than anything else what the people lived like. They had horses, and they you know, did the things that they did. Obviously, they had horns that they blew. Uh, it tells you a little bit more about what's going on than anything else. Again, here, they're, they're doing some fighting. I mean, look at this figure. That's really well done. The one on the left. This one's got a pig, and it's got God knows what that is, uh, and a person behind it. But so I just think that they're, they're kind of interesting. Look at the coloration. Wide range of colors for the most part. Reds and blacks and green and turquoise. Uh, some very interesting things. Whites. Now this is uh, this is one. It's a little hard to see. Can you make that out reasonably well or not? I, again, had to enhance it just a little bit or it wouldn't have shown up. But you can see, I mean, the, the, the faces are kind of interesting because they're not these classical Greek faces. This is more a face to show whatever's going on in the picture. That's, I mean, the mouth is a, almost looks like a Japanese woodblock, the mouth and the eyes. I mean, you could almost imagine that in a Japanese woodblock. So at any rate, then we get the, the uh, mosaics, which are really something. Look at that. Uh, that is absolutely a splendid piece of art. And in fact, these Delos mosaics, as I have down, are considered the high watermark of uh, mosaics in Greece during the ancient uh, Greek period. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Again, it's got about half of the ones. Well, let me, I got to move. Uh, this is uh, uh, Lacoris killing Ambrosia. It was changed into a grapevine. Go figure that one out if, you, if you're into that. But, uh, but look at the faces. The faces are not the faces of classical Greece. They are the faces of Hellenic Greece and Roman Greece. How do you like that guy? Isn't that something? This is an enhanced version, uh, Tiger and uh, Dinos. And this is what it looks like outside. So I had to do some work on it to get it to you know, show up. And then we've got these uh, statues. And they're really well done. It's a shame we don't have the whole statues because they're really, really well done. And then this. This kind of work almost foreshadows what we're going to see uh, around 600 AD, 400 AD, the Roman stuff, very similar how it's done. Now, next week, we will do Athens, and I am done for the day. I will put this on, and you can sign out as you like, but this is a wonderful drone flight over the Acropolis. I want to stay and look at it. It's a good spot. It shows you what the place looks like. That's happening. We'll be doing that in here. the senior center delighted to have you come back uh, uh, you know, kind of like voting early in office
Okay, now I'd like to ask if anybody's got any questions, uh, being more into our, our own time, uh, I'd be happy to answer. You can just unmute if you have a question. Yeah, everybody can unmute. I did, not, I did not get the meaning of the freezes. What did you say that is? The freeze? The, the I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I beg your pardon. I said, I did not get the meaning of the freeze. I think that you were talking about. Oh, like okay. A freeze line. would. All right. You've got the the pediment, which is right below the roof line. Okay. Then you've got the metope, which generally is right below that, with architectural members separating the different pictures, so okay. to speak. And then a freeze generally will go all around a building. Oh. And what it's trying to do is portray, for instance, the end of the Peloponnesian War. And so it shows, starts off with the gods, which is what caused them to win. Then we go to the, sol to the rulers, then to the soldiers. Then you might, as you go around the building, come up with the uh, artisans doing whatever they do. And finally, the slaves, as you come back around the building <laughs> and meet up with the gods again where you started. So it's, it's, it's literally a tableau that continues all around, uh, as best I understand it. Okay. Does that help? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah got an answer. Tom, I had a question. Okay. Yeah, I think it was in Santorini, that museum, the pictures on the cylindrical pithos, the, the jugs or amphoras, how did, what, do, do they know what the um, color was, how it was made, what those dyes are on the... Um, jars that last so long you know the original I, I i would suspect they do uh but again that, that going into that kind of detail was not something that i wanted to do for this because you could you could load down i mean i, I tried to keep it on the simple side just say gee isn't it nice it still exists mm -hmm. uh i'm sure they have taken you know done analysis of them because they need to know how, how to preserve them and, and you can't preserve them if you don't know what it is you're preserving Certain things tend to preserve once the air hits them a lot worse than other things. Anything that's iron based is going to green them essentially. Same thing with copper or, or, or tin or you know bronze. So they, yeah, I'm sure that they know precisely what what it is. But I, I don't know that I, I didn't read anywhere particularly what they were. My guess is going back that far, you're talking berries and, 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 and different types of uh, grains and such, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, know, you want blue or purple blue, you go and you get uh, flax. I mean, you know, that type of thing, right? So, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> no, that's a good answer. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you. I, I hope to see you all in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think you'll find that the museums in Athens are really spectacular. Uh, <laughs> things that they have, I mean, are just incredible. Uh, I, I could go to the Antiquity Museum and stay there for a week. It, 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 it's, it's, just, it's just astounding what they have. Uh, and then the, the Acropolis Museum, which is brand new, practically, it's laid out just like you'd want a modern museum to be. Uh, it is absolutely user-friendly. Uh, things are put out in context, which is what's so lacking in so many museums. You'll see these things out, but you don't really, unless you want to read a page of you know, what it's about, it makes no, little or no sense. In the Acropolis Museum, the way the stuff is laid out, it makes abundant sense immediately because they basically taking the freeze and run it around the whole interior of the museum. It's, it's incredible. 
Uh, I just wish they had more of the original stuff uh, because in fact, it, a lot of it they've had to reconstruct that lighter color as opposed to the darker, which is the real, but that's still marvelous. Thank you so much, Tom. This was a great presentation. I really want to go to Greece now since I've watched this. Um, so yeah, I, but you got to look at more. The, you got to look at more than the, you know, the mountains and the and all that stuff too. People did create some good stuff there. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful job. <laughs> really a enjoyed it. The reason I say that, you know. Yeah, but uh, if you are not registered for part two in two weeks, please go on our website, TallahasseeSeniorFoundation.org. And, um, and find the class and go ahead and register. Uh, thank you so much. Check out our other classes too. And thanks all for, thanks everyone for joining us today. You all thanks, have a great Tom. Day. Thank you, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Karen. It's good to see you all. Thank you very, very much for uh, you, joining me. And I, I hope that you enjoy the one in a couple of weeks too. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.